Hi, this is John Romano, and I'm recording this lecture of the Byzantine Empire for my course, World Civilization to 1500. What we had said in previous classes in the centuries after the 4th century, the Roman Empire would face a series of existential problems. Uh, among other things, we had mentioned, for instance, epidemic disease, declining population, uh, economic contraction, political turmoil, uh, social unrest, and finally, military threats from the outside, from uh, nomadic groups who were attacking it. What we really did not spend as much time on, however, is that depending upon where you were in the Roman Empire, in fact, the Roman Empire actually had a very different kind of fate. And uh, in particular, we think that uh, especially as all of these invaders were beginning to uh, begin to assail the Roman Empire, the Romans made a concerted effort to especially to hold on to some of those easternmost provinces, uh, which uh, really were the ones that were particularly rich. Uh, and um, what really uh, within because of these efforts uh, in uh, what really had been a part of the Roman Empire in the East, uh, the classical empire, the classical Roman Empire, would continue to survive. Uh, and this uh, civilization, to distinguish it from uh, the ancient Roman Empire, we often refer to uh, by the modern term, the Byzantine Empire. And I'm, I'm showing you here um, where the uh, Byzantine Empire was in the 11th century. Uh, although it's uh, the map of exactly which territories were in it uh, would change depending upon uh, the period of its existence. You can see just by looking at this that the heart of this empire uh, was uh, what today is modern day Greece, um, the Balkans, portions of southern Italy, and at some point also uh, portions of Syria. The capital city was one that we've already spoken about, uh, the city here of Constantinople, um, a, a really a city that had been chosen because it was easy uh, to defend. Um, and uh, we already said earlier uh, that this was a city uh, that was founded by Constantine, uh, the late Roman emperor, who was a military man, uh, and uh, figured that uh, this was a good point uh, to allow the, uh, the Romans to watch uh, the uh, uh, to to watch over the Persian Empire, to defend against invaders, and to hold on to some of the rich cities in the east. And uh, this was an area we think. Uh, here's another uh, medieval image of the city of Constantinople. Uh, this was an area uh, that offered access to trade routes um, on the Mediterranean and uh, really with traders who came further from the east, in addition uh, to just being a very good defensive spot as well. After uh, Constantine had founded this city uh, in the fourth century, it would be considered uh, in time the capital city of the empire. And uh, because of that influx of money, and uh, that the government would give to it. And because um, the seat of power of the Roman government would come to the city of Constantinople, uh, it would in fact in time become a huge city and really in its own right, a dominant political and economic power. And uh, altogether, um, this, uh, uh, this new capital city and uh, the empire uh, the, over, over which it was capital, would, uh, would last for another millennium. Uh, so, in fact, it was a very long existence uh, to uh, the, this, uh, what had originally just been a short, uh, a, a short decision to uh, move the capital city. As the Western Roman Empire crumbled in the 5th century, the eastern half would remain intact. Uh, and uh, all of those facets of Roman civilization that we had spoken a lot about, uh, Roman roads, uh, the ability to communicate or along them, uh, the imperial authority, um, things like, for instance, here, um, uh, long Roman-style processions, all of these things uh, would be inherited from Rome. Uh, and uh, we really, um, although we as modern historians 
refer to the people who lived in the civilizations as Byzantines. This is a term that would have struck them as extremely unfamiliar. Um, in fact, um, within the civilization itself, they would call themselves Romans, um, really as if nothing had changed uh, and they were this part of the same empire. This new state uh, was, um, some people feel, not only just uh, continued on the, the habits of um, having a very strong emperor, but in fact, some would say that um, the, uh, the emperor really uh, was even more powerful than uh, he had been within the later Roman Empire. Uh, this is really an autocracy to some degree. Uh, and um, the emperor would be one of the richest men in the empire. He would be a major benefactor, uh, for instance, sponsoring new churches. Um, and uh, he really uh, was seen to be someone who was very close to God, uh, in uh, just like similar to here to uh, the position of David uh, in the Old Testament. Uh, so the emperors saw themselves in the Byzantine Empire in a very similar uh, light. Uh, and uh, just to give you another sense of how uh, how close um, the emperor was to uh, to God, this is a, an, an imperial coin. On one side, it has the emperor uh, and peace. On the other side, it has an image of Jesus. Uh, so now uh, again, this is not the ancient Roman Empire em anymore. So um, the emperor no longer claims that he himself is God or uh, divine, uh, but um, he does say that uh, he experiences God's favor, He and he has a very close relationship uh, with Jesus. And uh, we think that um, this uh, kind of uh, very close relationship with the divine uh, allowed the emperor at times to even intervene in theological debates, um, because that was, it was seen as part of his role. On top of uh, these, uh, these uh, other uh, facets of uh, the emperor, we also see he has a large and, and a really complex series of servants uh, around him um, who take care of, of everything from just making sure his bedchamber is in order uh, to, making, uh, to taking care, for instance, uh, of collecting taxes and things like that. And uh, really, um, the way that uh, these uh, people are related to one another uh, is through this, this very rigid system of etiquette uh, that was meant really to, um, to lift up these rulers, uh, to uh, make it clear they're above all normal people, and par partially just through their clothing. Uh, they wore crowns, uh, silk robes. Uh, they wore purple, which was forbidden to others. Uh, and uh, we really see when other people came into contact with the emperor, uh, they would have to uh, prostrate themselves before him uh, and kiss his hands and feet. Uh, in some, some cases, going so far as having to kiss the instep of his foot. Uh, so a, a really uh, debasing yourself in front of the emperor. The most important early Byzantine emperor in the 6th century uh, was Justinian. Uh, who's shown right here in uh, the center of this famous mosaic that is actually in modern-day Italy. Uh, Justinian was known as an energetic and tireless worker, uh, in fact, um, known as so tireless that uh, some people have really at his own time criticized him for being practically demonic with the level of energy uh, that he displayed. Uh, and uh, this uh, is a very interesting mosaic in that uh, it shows uh, Justinian at the center of the state, uh, really surrounded uh, by three of the major facets of the state. Uh, on the uh, extreme left, you see members of the military. Uh, you see, of course, the shield. There's a Cairo. This is a Christian army. Uh, to his left here are some civil servants, and to his right, or the clergy. And you can see, of course, he's giving a pattern as a gift uh, to the clergy to be able to perform the liturgy. 
Uh, you also will notice, by the way, that there's not much of a difference in the way that the uh, civil servants and the clergy are dressed. And in fact, the clergy actually base their clothing uh, on uh, on the, those of the Rome, late Roman civil servants. Justinian did not come from a, a very glorious family. He actually came from fairly obscure origins, uh, but uh, he was a disciplined student. He got, received an excellent education, uh, and he worked in the government bureaucracy. Um, once Justinian uh, took uh, power, um, we think uh, that uh, uh, he uh, actually ran into a challenge to his authority quite early. Um, there were actually uh, riots in the capital city against him. And uh, one of the few things uh, that kept him uh, in power was his wife here uh, in the middle here, Theodora, uh, who uh, really uh, urged him to stay on uh, and to uh, fight back against those who were rioting against his rule. Uh, so Theodora was known uh, to be uh, a real support to him uh, during his time as emperor. Uh, Justinian felt that, um, uh, and here is Justinian uh, as uh, shown here in an ivory carving uh, as a soldier. Um, Justinian felt that a true imperial capital like the city of Constantinople uh, needed to lavish resources on it as Romans had always done. And so he actually is the person who builds the enormous church uh, that uh, is still standing in modern day Istanbul, the name of the mo modern day uh, Constantinople. And this church is known as the Hagia Sophia, a term that means holy wisdom. And a, a term, in fact, that shows just how much respect that the Byzantines had for, uh, for wisdom as being something that was good and holy. Uh, similar to the biblical book of wisdom um, and uh, you see here the uh, uh, the enormous dome uh, that uh, the uh, the church of the Hagia Sophia had uh, those uh, those minarets uh, were only put up in a much later period uh, when it was temporarily converted to a mosque uh, and uh, you can see inside here get some idea of why this was such an impressive structure uh, and in fact, it would have been even more so initially, uh, would have all sorts of precious stones and gold uh, that would have shown and uh, lamps all around. And uh, the way it was constructed, we think that uh, light would have poured in um, when uh, the priests were uh, doing the liturgy. So it would have been truly impressive. Uh, here's another uh, view of the same, uh, the same space without quite as much light. Uh, you can just see uh, how huge it is. Another thing uh, that Justinian accomplished while he was emperor uh, was that um, he, like many emperors, had felt that Romans were supposed to uh, be very careful with how they kept their laws. And this is something we've seen before, uh, and this is something that Romans were still interested in doing. And um, in fact, Justinian has his uh, legal scholars codify Roman law. Uh, in fact, uh, very systematically go through old laws, getting rid of ones that were um, repetitive or contradictory, uh, and creating a definitive uh, law book uh, that applied to everyone within the empire. Um, we also see uh, Justinian uh, was um, quite interested in uh, attempting to take back as much as possible some of the territory in Western Europe uh, that had been taken over by a group of barbarians, as far as the Byzantines were concerned. And uh, he did send out armies to re reclaim uh, portions of Italy, of uh, Northwestern Africa, and Spain. Uh, but unfortunately, um, in all these cases, um, these territories were only temporarily uh, reconquered, uh, and uh, really, the Byzantine Empire did not have the resources to hold on to them forever. Uh, and uh, what we're, we're actually we're going to see that after Justinian dies, the trend is really quite in the opposite direction. Uh, the Byzantines actually are going to lose even more of their territory as the result of uh, the emergence of Islam. Uh, and uh, 
that actually uh, is especially going to apply to territories uh, in um, North Africa, Egypt, uh, and most of Syria are all going to uh, turn over to Muslim warriors. Um, during uh, that, that great initial push of uh, the warriors of Islam uh, after the coming of Muhammad. And in fact, um, the, uh, the Muslim soldiers uh, would actually even threaten the heart of the empire uh, and actually would carry out a siege in the city of Constantinople. Uh, and uh, in fact, many contemporaries felt that um, once uh, this city fell, uh, it might well spell the end of the world. And uh, this um, this uh, th this really was the most desperate of straits for the Byzantines, uh, and um, this was the time that they decide to pull out a secret weapon. Yes, and they really did have a secret weapon, and you can see it here in this manuscript illustration being put uh, into use. And this is something known as Greek fire. Uh, and uh, what we we were actually a little bit uncertain were the exact um, chemical composition uh, of this secret weapon was. Um, the, the major ingredient appears to be a highly unrefined form of petroleum. Uh, and uh, you can see here it's actually pumped out of ships. Uh, and um, the effective part uh, of this is that because uh, it is petroleum based, uh, this fire can actually um, burn on water. Um, and uh, so you really didn't even have to be a particularly good shot to fire it against enemies. Um, and uh, it could be really extremely effective against the wooden ships of uh, the Muslim invaders who were attempting to take over Constantinople. Um, just in case, by the way, some of you wondered, well, why didn't the Byzantines use this not only to defend their capital city, uh, but to you know conquer all sorts of other places. And uh, the reason is that um, we think that the Byzantines only would use this in the direst of situations uh, because um, um, Greek fire was extremely difficult to control uh, and it uh, really didn't know friend or foe. And so if you had, for instance, the wind change directions, uh, all of a sudden you could find the fire uh, coming back to your own ships. Uh, but this was one of those desperate situations that called for it and in effect um, allowed them to keep uh, their capital city. We also think as a whole, although um, certainly the, um, uh, the Muslim invaders had a lot of experience fighting, uh, they did not have a lot of experience with fighting in the mountains. And uh, in fact, a lot of Turkey is quite mountainous, which allowed them uh, again to stave off destruction. As a result of this brush with death, we think that the Byzantines uh, create an entirely new organization known as the theme system. Um, and uh, what they would do in essence is that they split up all of the territory in the empire uh, into smaller provinces. In each of them, they sent out a general who was under the control of the emperor. And uh, this general would assume responsibility uh, for both civil administration and military fighting. Uh, and um, the, these uh, generals were meant then, of course, to uh, take orders from uh, the emperor. And they were closely supervised. They didn't take control over areas. But because um, these generals ruled in a particular area, um, they could... Um, really make sure to have a very quick response if anyone attacked their region. The new soldiers who were put into these armies were free peasants like this guy here. Um, and in effect, um, what would happen is that peasants uh, would be uh, given land for free by the government. And in exchange, um, they would have to... Uh, uh, they would have to train with the army and uh, provide their armor. This system, the theme system, we think, uh, on the whole, uh, proved to be, to be very resilient. And um, it actually meant that free peasants also had a lot more of their land and that they really had a good incentive to want to drive off invaders off to their own territory. 
Uh, it meant that more agriculture was practiced. Um, the theme system first manages to push Muslims out of, of what today is modern day Turkey. And then in fact, in time, it will actually allow Byzantines to go on the offensive. And that is especially under the reign of the emperor whose uh, famous image I'm showing you here known as Basil II. Uh, by the way, before I go on, I should just note on this image, there's perhaps no better illustration of this idea uh, that uh, Byzantine emperors were put in place directly by God. You can see, in effect, uh, the crown is being dropped down by Jesus and the, uh, uh, the um, angels are putting it in place. And of also the expectation that the populace would grovel underneath uh, Basil. Um, altogether, you can see this... Um, uh, this attitude that the Byzantines often had, that uh, there is one God in heaven, there is one emperor on earth, and there is one people beneath him, one Byzantine people beneath the emperor. Basil II, uh, during his time as, uh, as emperor, was a fantastic general, uh, and he actually was able to push into Syria with the Byzantines, uh, territories they had not held on to for uh, quite a long time, uh, and uh, they actually, um, he will actually go to war uh, with um, uh, as many areas uh, in um, uh, Eastern Europe, including especially um, destroying the kingdom of the Bulgarians, uh, destroying it from its previous independent status. And uh, the story, which not all historians believe, uh, is that supposedly um, he, after one of these particularly brutal battles against Bulgarians, he would blind 14,000 of them. Uh, and uh, he would blind the majority of these people he captured, uh, save for um, every hundredth man uh, who, whom he would allow to keep one eye uh, to be able to guide the rest of them back to their homeland. I should say also that Basil is renowned uh, for his diplomacy with some of the other Eastern European peoples uh, whom he did not conquer. Altogether, too, we think Basil um, uh, taxed uh, the, the wealthy territories of the Byzantine Empire well, uh, and he distributed some of that money to culture as well, making him a very well-rounded emperor altogether. Despite this kind of success, we think that uh, the Byzantine Empire is going to get into recurrent tensions with Western Europeans. And although the Byzantines came from the same empire uh, as Western Europeans, um, as uh, they really are going to begin to diverge in many different ways. One of the ways that would have been most obvious would be that uh, the Byzantine Empire conducted its business in Greek now, not in Latin or and he the derivative of languages uh, from Latin. Uh, and uh, we're going to see, too, in uh, the Byzantine Empire, as I mentioned earlier, um, there is going to remain far closer contact between church and state. Um, and uh, really, this is not going to be a conflict, as it will be in Western Europe. Byzantines tended to think of Western Europeans as being rude, badly educated, and really a bunch of barbarians who were good for fighting, but frankly, little else. Um, and uh, really, uh, in some ways, the stereotypes uh, flew right back, uh, back and forth, because Western Europeans um, felt of them as a, the Byzantines, a group of snobs, uh, heretics, uh, being overly luxurious and being uh, really cheating people left and right. And both these attitudes and the fact that uh, the Byzantines felt that they were, Western Europeans were sitting on land that should have been theirs uh, meant that there were always tensions between these civilizations. Yet no one could deny uh, that at its height, the Byzantine Empire was a very rich place. Uh, and in fact, the Byzantines were known uh, for having a very strong economy. Uh, they had abundant agricultural surpluses. Um, we know too um, that um, they had very good, uh, uh, very good artisans working in them. Um, all sorts of different media. Um, uh, so, for instance, here you're seeing ivory, um, glassware, uh, certain forms of clothing, um, 
No, they worked, uh, for instance, in gems and jewelry. Uh, all of these things are things that the Byzantines were very good at. Um, one particular item uh, that is of interest to us, especially studying world civilization, uh, is that the Byzantines did at some point figure out how to make silk, uh, and intelligently uh, they made it a government monopoly. So the government benefited from all the money uh, from the silk industry. No one knows exactly uh, how they figured this out, as, as we've discussed earlier. Uh, silk had long been associated as a, a Chinese luxury item. Um, one story that circulated around the Byzantine Empire was that a group of monks traveled to China. Uh, they had um, hollowed out these uh, staffs that they had with them. And then when the Chinese weren't looking, they took a bunch of silkworms, and they stuffed it inside their, their staffs, uh, and uh, then they, they just sort of walked on back to the Byzantine Empire. You can believe that or not. It may be, well be a myth. Um, the Byzantines uh, really tried to maintain as much as possible uh, Constantinople as a major trading center. And in fact, um, all sorts of long distance traders uh, will come into that city, uh, many of whom, in fact, uh, were uh, Muslims, uh, Indians, Chinese. Um, in some sense, this was the link to the, the broader Western world, because in fact, some Western European merchants would actually come to the city of Constantinople uh, to trade as well. Uh, and uh, this trading was supported uh, by uh, all kinds of banking and uh, economic partnerships in the Byzantine world. So it was really, uh, at its heart, a complex economy in part because of this stream of merchants that came into the city, um, and in part because of the presence of the heart of the government, uh, the city of Constantinople really had a vibrant urban life throughout this period. Uh, and again, even just because of uh, the palace itself, uh, there were a lot of people working there. Uh, for the emperor, as many as 20,000 people were working uh, for the government. Um, and in addition to that, we think that the city of Constantinople um, was really a beautiful place to be. Uh, it was a place that had all sorts of um, gardens and sculptures, uh, many of which actually came directly from the ancient world, from ancient Rome. Uh, would have had all sorts of fountains. Uh, and uh, in addition to the palace of uh, the emperor, there were also all sorts of uh, uh, luxury palaces of other aristocrats with, uh, uh, with beautiful courtyards and halls and chapels. Um, we think that um, when we look at both the city of Constantinople and more generally, um, the Byzantine world tends to be one of men. Um, we think that um, similar to in the way in rich women in classical uh, the classical Greek world, uh, the Byzantine women tended to live in separate apartments, and they did not tend to receive male visitors from outside their own household. And uh, in fact, women did not tend to participate in banquets or parties which could compromise uh, their honor. So by and large, we're talking about a men's world. Um, in uh, the city of Constantinople, there would also have been less privileged dwellings, uh, apartments for low-level administrators, for instance. Uh, but, um, as I mentioned earlier, still more of an urban existence than in many places in Western Europe, or almost all. Um, there were, for instance, um, things like uh, this here, uh, city baths, um, that uh, everyone could go to equally. Uh, bars and restaurants, theaters. Uh, and uh, really, uh, one of the um, sports that remains extremely popular in the Byzantine Empire is chariot racing. Now, this is, for instance, is an emperor starting a chariot race. Uh, now, some of um, the sports uh, that um, ancient Romans had once really liked, uh, say, for instance, um, the gladiatorial games, blood sport, um, well, with especially uh, in a Christian worldview, those could no longer be tolerated. However, um, there was nothing necessarily immoral about chariot racing. And uh, we think that, in fact, it was wildly popular in the Byzantine world, uh, really attended by all classes. Uh, and um, there were individual teams that people would root for. 
uh, and bet all kinds of money on them. The Byzantine world is also known for its high culture. And in particular, this was uh, really inspired by the classical Greek world. And uh, I mean, uh, especially considering that the Byzantines um, spoke Greek still, uh, they really did feel that all of the great works of the ancient Greek world uh, were uh, really their heritage. And so they would read ancient Greek literature, uh, philosophy, uh, science. And uh, this was um, helped by the fact that um, just to be able to work for the government, one needed to have at least basic literacy, meaning that there were a lot of people uh, who knew how to read and write. And uh, altogether, we think there was a very heavy focus here on the humanities, uh, literature, history, philosophy. Um, and uh, in fact, um, many uh, people we know um, both owned and in some cases copied uh, classical Greek manuscripts. And so if you've read something, for instance, like Homer, you really have Byzantines to thank uh, for preserving uh, this ancient culture. Uh, and it wasn't just a matter of um, passively reading some of these works. Byzantine scholars uh, would, um, uh, they would actually write their own commentaries upon things like Homer, uh, Plato, and Aristotle. And uh, they would actually develop new textbooks uh, that in some cases really um, uh, really use a Christian lens or understanding uh, to get at these classical works. In addition to this engagement uh, with the ancient world, we also see a new religious uh, development starting to take place. Uh, and just as we had seen in Western Europe, uh, Christianity becomes the order of the day uh, in the Byzantine Empire. And uh, really a, um, I won't say a distinctive religious direction from the Western European church, uh, often referred to as the Eastern Orthodox Church. And uh, really, um, um, there are several differences that uh, end up springing up with Western Europe in matters uh, regarding, for instance, things like doctrine, uh, ritual, uh, and church authority. Um, and uh, uh, perhaps um, what would have um, appeared to be most striking is that uh, Byzantine emperors tend to view the church as a kind of department of state. Um, and um, in fact, there was nothing to stop the emperor uh, from hiring and firing uh, priests. And in particular, the highest priest in the Eastern Orthodox world, uh, one of them pictured here, uh, the position known as the Patriarch of Constantinople. Uh, the Patriarch was a, a, a bishop, but really um, the, uh, the highest uh, bishop within the Byzantine world. Uh, it was one of those, um, uh, those areas uh, that were particularly important um, for the end of the ancient world and continuing to the medieval world. Uh, and uh, serving something uh, like uh, the position um, of uh, the, the Pope uh, in uh, the Western European world. Uh, and uh, we know, for instance, uh, one way in which um, he was similar is that um, uh, the liturgy of uh, the city of uh, Constantinople becomes the most important liturgy uh, for the Eastern Orthodox world. And again, just generally a liturgy that was known to be um, very poetic, um, very long in some ways. Um, the downside of a very close connection between church and state uh, was that very often patriarchs had to deliver, deliver sermons that would simply uh, support imperial policy. Um, the, the other side was that they could have been fired otherwise, uh, and uh, they would have to encourage obedience to the emperor. By far the most divisive policy between the Western world and the Eastern Orthodox Church uh, was a religious policy known as iconoclasm, a term that literally means the breaking of icons, um, images, of Jesus, uh, the saints, and other figures of religious ex significance. Um, and although um, the term itself refers to the breaking of icons, as you can see here, they in some cases could just be uh, uh, 
a wash of the uh, painted over. Uh, this policy um, really uh, was one uh, that was extremely controversial um, in uh, the Eastern Orthodox world because um, uh, people had long held the belief that artwork uh, could inspire a reverence of uh, of Jesus and the uh, the saints. Um, it could help you to meditate. The reason why, um, especially at the, in the imperial uh, side, uh, that uh, people begin to uh, promote this policy is that the belief spread that um, uh, there had to be a good reason why uh, Byzantines had been losing uh, against the Muslims in battle. And uh, the most logical reason seemed to be that they actually took a lot more seriously uh, the uh, commandment that you're not supposed to uh, make graven images of God. And uh, so, in fact, that is why perhaps that they were losing against Muslims. And so uh, for a period of time, um, a really tortured period of time, uh, many emperors would destroy icons and prohibit their use in churches. And uh, this is a move at the time that would spark riots because the icons were often very popular. Um, this was finally abandoned, uh, the policy, but only really after having destroyed um, many examples of early Byzantine art. Um, especially in this brand, uh, in Eastern Orthodoxy, this brand of Christianity, um, Greek, ancient Greek philosophy is very important throughout. Um, and uh, really, um, we really see theologians um, trying to use the tools of ancient Greek philosophy um, to be able to do things like figuring out, uh, you know, what exactly uh, was the nature of Jesus? Um, how did the relationship in the Trinity work exactly? Um, and uh, these debates um, were often extremely technical in nature. And at least some people in Western Europe tended to view them as hair splitting. Much as we had seen in Western Europe, uh, often some of um, the most inspiring figures uh, in the religious realm were monks. And uh, in some ways, the experience of monasticism in the Eastern Orthodox world uh, is one that was very similar to that of Western Europe. Um, it had uh, grown out too of um, the, uh, the tendency of many people to want to live life a life as a hermit, go to deserts or caves, uh, and um, dedicate themselves to God, uh, pray, fast, uh, keep celibacy. Um, and uh, uh, the father of this movement in the East uh, was often viewed here as uh, St. Anthony. Uh, but uh, Anthony kept finding that the further out the desert he went, the more people would try to follow him. Uh, and um, really, um, this is uh, symbolic of this larger trend of people to begin to turn from uh, living as hermits and beginning to build monastic communities. And uh, again, some of the, um, uh, the, the, the trends here are similar to those that we had seen uh, in, the, in Western Europe. Uh, monks would give up their personal possessions. Uh, they would live in community. They would obey their superiors. Uh, they devote themselves to work and prayer. Uh, and here's just one a spot, a uh, renowned Byzantine spot of monasticism that remains to this day. Many Byzantine monks were known uh, for their devotion to piety. Uh, and uh, really, in some of them, uh, in many cases, we know uh, that there are some monks who um, uh, go in search of a mystical union with God. Uh, there is also, however, a very practical side uh, to the life of Byzantine monks. Uh, we know, for instance, that they provided social services. Uh, for instance, um, there are certain cases um, that uh, uh, they would help in uh, aid in relief efforts after disasters. Uh, so sort of like a social uh, security net. Um, we think that in spite of this uh, reputation for holiness that some have, uh, the tensions between Eastern Orthodoxy and, uh, and Western Christianity uh, would simply grow over time. Uh, we know, for instance, 
uh, that Byzantine theologians uh, objected to the, the use of unleavened bread in the Eucharist. Uh, there were also debates that, about the precise relationship among the people in the, uh, the, the persons in the Trinity. Um, we also see that uh, the Patriarch of Constantinople felt uh, that all different Christian jurisdictions should be autonomous. Uh, and um, you can imagine that this really, um, uh, this really sat poorly with people in Western Europe who felt that the Pope should be head and shoulders uh, above other bishops. In fact, he should have um, power over them. Um, and um, a combination of these and many other factors uh, led to a huge amount of strain between uh, the, the two sides of what had once been um, a united uh, Christianity. And uh, um, the, the, this, these uh, tensions became so deep uh, that eventually it would lead to schism. Uh, and uh, this finally happens uh, in the year 1054, a year in which um, both the Pope and uh, the Patriarch of Constantinople will mutually excommunicate one another. And uh, uh, the reason I give this date in particular, 1054, is that uh, this is a schism that has begun, but has not ended. In fact, uh, it lasts until this day. And uh, uh, again, I, I'll stress that it's really not just a question of some of these um, um, teachings or practices. It really is that a, a large cultural gulf had, uh, had come between uh, the two sides of Christianity. It really, however, when we talk about uh, the Byzantine world uh, in the, the end of the 11th century and later, uh, we do think uh, that there are many factors uh, that begin to contribute, uh, eventually leading to its decline and fall. Uh, one, in fact, is uh, it concerns the theme system. Um, the theme system increasingly became corrupt. Uh, many nobles were able to uh, take some of the territory of free peasants. Uh, and um, the danger for this for the state was twofold. Uh, first of all, um, there were was fewer tax money uh, coming uh, from all of these small plots uh, of um, free peasants who once existed. And uh, in fact, um, in some cases, uh, by taking their land, they meant uh, it really meant that there were fewer people to fight wars in the various themes. And many of these aristocrats, as you can tell, uh, were hostile to government and even paying taxes at times. Um, perhaps, though, what uh, the uh, what really ends up destroying uh, the Byzantine world are the challenges that it faced from Western Europe. Uh, and uh, in fact, um, both Western Europeans and Byzantines begin to fight uh, with one another over certain territories. Uh, for instance, uh, some of the holdings of the Byzantines uh, in southern Italy. The worst of the conflicts, though, uh, between these two worlds uh, would come in the year 1204, uh, when a uh, group of Western Europeans uh, made up both of people from Venice Venetians uh, and from France will um, capture and sack the city of Constantinople uh, for themselves. So, in fact, they would attack a, another Christian city. Um, this was disastrous for the Byzantines. Uh, and what was even worse was that after this initial attack, uh, many of these Western Europeans decided to carve out some territories of the Byzantine Empire for themselves. Uh, in time, the Byzantines would manage to recapture the city of Constantinople in 1261, uh, but many people think that uh, uh, losing large portions of their empire uh, had fatally weakened them, uh, especially uh, against the many Muslim en enemies around them. Uh, we'll talk more next time about the final end of the Byzantine world, uh, but uh, it is important to note uh, that most people would tend to see the importance of the Byzantine world uh, really in some ways as going long beyond uh, this one civilization. Uh, and especially, in, uh, of course, in world history, it's important to note just how important the Byzantines ultimately would be 
uh, in the history of Slavic peoples around them. And in fact, uh, their, the influence of the Byzantines will continue uh, even after uh, the, their empire will go under. The, the reason for this is that uh, the Byzantines, um, you know, no less than uh, Western Europeans, felt that one of the basic missions of Christians uh, is to uh, convert uh, those who are not in the fold already. And as a result of this, uh, they end up actually sending out missionaries to the Balkans and to the Bulgarians to convert them to Eastern Orthodox Christianity. Uh, and uh, the most famous of the missionaries they would send by far are the two men who are pictured, uh, the brothers in this picture, uh, Cyril and Methodius, who are considered saints. Um, Cyril and Methodius came from uh, what today is modern day Greece. Uh, and uh, they had grown up uh, be able to speak a uh, Slavic tongue. And in the mid 9th century, they decided to go out and conduct a series of missions to Bulgaria. Uh, and um, as part of these missions, um, they decided that they were going to um, uh, they were going to translate both the Bible and the liturgy uh, into um, the Slavic tongue uh, of the area. Uh, and um, to be able to do this first, uh, they had to create an alphabet uh, for the previous literate Slavs. And uh, this alphabet is uh, in there. Uh, you can see they're holding here. Uh, this is something known as the Cyrillic alphabet uh, after Cyril. And uh, uh, if only for that, of course, that, that it was a huge influence. This is still the alphabet, for instance, that is used uh, in Russian to this day. Um, altogether, uh, and uh, you notice, by the way, there was uh, no hesitation uh, to use the vernacular language. Um, uh, they didn't really have a problem with that. Uh, altogether, we think that uh, these missions of Cyril and Methodius and other missionaries uh, ended up uh, being very, um, very successful uh, and would stimulate all kinds of conversions uh, in Slavic territories. And in fact, now um, what was on... Uh, in addition to just having the Christian faith, um, now, um, because they had an alphabet, uh, they could sustain literacy among Slavic peoples. Uh, and uh, we, we really, uh, all together, um, uh, the Byzantine uh, influence uh, becomes extremely important in Eastern Europe, uh, perhaps especially uh, in Russia. Um, and uh, really, we see uh, that although... Um, Byzantines were already on the map of Russians. Uh, more and more, um, we'll see Russians convert. And uh, along with taking up uh, the faith, the Eastern Orthodox faith, uh, they will take up the Byzantine culture as well, including uh, the art and architecture of the Byzantine world. Um, on top of this, we'll see that um, there's a very direct influence uh, of um, the political scene of the Byzantine world on the Russian world. And in fact, Russian princes believed that um, just as the Byzantine emperor had had a very firm control uh, over the church in the Byzantine Empire, so too should they have a very similar control over the church in the areas that they have. Uh, and uh, we will see too that on top of all these other things, um, the uh, the Russians will eventually uh, claim that they had inherited the imperial mantle of the Byzantine world. Um, and uh, they, in fact, will say that um, Moscow was uh, was the third Rome. The first Rome is easy. That is the city of Rome. The second Rome uh, was the city of Constantinople. And the third Rome uh, was, in fact, uh, in, by their reckoning, was uh, Moscow. And uh, uh, again, this is just one modern example of um, uh, the uh, Eastern Orthodox services uh, uh, of the Russian uh, church, and uh, uh, which again, in many ways, uh, preserve like a time capsule uh, many of the influences from the Byzantine world. All right, that's it. Thank you for your attention. Bye-bye.